Hey, just a quick content warning. This is going to have some flashing lights, so check the video description for timestamps of those. But just be careful if you are sensitive to that sort of thing. All right, here we go. My friend Layla wrote an essay about Diaspora a few years ago. I go back to it once every few months to reread the story of her immigration from Moscow to New York, the difficulties of grappling with their Azeri heritage while speaking Russian, while looking like a brown person from any number of countries, of the disconnect that comes with knowing you belong to a place that you have no memory of. It's a powerful piece of writing that cuts to the core of the experience of being part of a diaspora community, that acknowledges the longing for community while never being certain that community exists, or if it did exist, if it would call you its own. The essay ends with this question. What else don't we, the unclaimed, know to claim? I kept thinking about that line while reading Ray Najati's Apocalypse Keys, because both Layla's piece and this game evoke in me the same desperate sense of longing to belong. Apocalypse Keys is a Powered by the Apocalypse game set to be released by Evil Hat on April 17th, which focuses on a group of monstrous people who work for a secret organization called Division, protecting the world from supernatural terrors called Harbingers. Beautifully illustrated and meticulously written, I don't think I have to tell you this is a game I'd recommend checking out. You all know what I'd do here, I'm not really in the habit of shit-talking indie games. What I do want to do is try to convey the overwhelming sense of desperation reading this game made me feel. Every playbook is a different and interesting interpretation of some form of eldritch power, but the core framework of this game is centered around a struggle to cling to what love you can find, all while in the back of your mind, you're tempted to forsake everything, to accept yourself as an abomination and leave a gaping wound where the planet once spun. You live in a world that can never truly accept you, the game says. But everything about the text suggests that you're going to reach for that acceptance anyway. Apocalypse Keys has seven playbooks, each embodying an omen-class demon, a humanoid person with some sort of supernatural, divine, or aberrant powers that make them hugely useful to Division as agents to fight the Harbingers. These powers vary in interesting and complex ways. The Summoned is a person called from afar, with a destiny that binds them to destruction. Whereas the Hungry is the embodiment of consumption, constantly pulled to devour friend and foe alike. Each playbook has a unique spin, but right up at the top, you get a little snippet summarizing what this archetype is all about. And for every single playbook, the last sentence starts with, My heart yearns to... It's a really compelling structure for your characters. Every single player is, from the very beginning, instructed to yearn for something. The quality and circumstances of each playbook's yearning is all over the place. The Fallen yearns for worship, always chasing the full divinity that was taken from them. The Last yearns both for comfort and to comfort others, the last survivor of an unspeakable tragedy who sees the loss of their people all around them. Furthermore, each playbook has impulses, prompts incentivizing players to roleplay certain situations in order to gain XP. Some of these impulses are, frankly, heartbreaking. Did you let go of one of your memories and replace it with a new one? Did you share a story of your people and what you lost? Did you humiliate yourself for the intimacy you crave? Your characters are constantly pushing their emotional limits, struggling to both fight against nightmare monsters beyond human comprehension, while also being incentivized to put themselves in tough positions. This game is interested in characters who make bad choices, who want so badly to be accepted that they'll lose part of themselves to belong. Their only other option is to break the world they're trying so hard to save. It's Holy Week when I'm writing the script. I'm thinking a lot about Christianity and Catholicism, as I often do around this time of the year. I always think to myself during the week leading up to Good Friday, you know, even though I think the Catholic Church is a fundamentally broken institution, what if I went to Mass? Just once. It's a silly impulse. But it happens every year. I miss the music. There's a song that my family used to sing during Lent. 
Ashes by Tom Connery. It's not even a particularly old song, but it always made me feel something, a connection to the core of the season of penance. We rise again from ashes, from the good we've failed to do. We rise again from ashes to create ourselves anew. And it's like, <laughs> that's good Catholic shit. We get fire imagery, we get guilt, we get the destruction inherent in creation. Despite it not really being a traditional hymn at all, there's a reason it's stuck around. <laughs> there are days I miss the community that came with being religious. It always gets bad around Easter and Christmas. Sometimes I'll bring up the Midnight Mass soundtrack and kind of waddle around my apartment, singing until I can feel the lyrics behind my eyes. <laughs> if all the world is ashes, then must our lives be true. An offering of ashes. An offering to you. I can't go back to that community. <laughs> the church has rejected too many of my friends, stuck too closely to dangerous dogma, repeatedly shot itself in the foot instead of simply saying, sorry, it's time for us to make amends. It's failed to do a lot of good. It's left too many people unclaimed. Apocalypse Keys certainly pushes players to consider how they might be accepted in a place where they are ostracized, but it recognizes that there is only so much pride you can swallow before you decide to eat the world. To underscore that tension between supplication and rampage, the game uses a number of systems that make it impossible for you to keep your powers in check forever. Eventually, you get tired of being nice. Eventually, you're going to go apeshit. In most PBTA games, success is broken into three tiers. A six or lower is a failure, a seven to nine is a complicated success, and a 10 plus is a complete success. In Apocalypse Keys, Najati implements an overshoot tier, punishing players for rolling too well. Instead, a two to seven is a failure, and an eight to 10 is a success and an 11 plus is a disastrous success, wherein players' powers break through and their monstrous nature overwhelms their good intentions. The math on the scale is bad. Now you're 58% likely to completely botch your roll, an inversion of the typical PBTA success rate. This is where darkness tokens come in. Every time your character engages with one of the core themes of their rulebook, be that giving into their own power, or feeling ignored and unimportant, they can gain darkness tokens, which can be spent to add plus one to each roll per token spent. This means that in order to reliably succeed on rolls, players must again look to the kinds of themes and ideas of their playbook and actively seek out these situations, oftentimes putting themselves in emotionally vulnerable positions. However, if you gain too many darkness tokens, your character is torn between their monstrous and human nature pulled toward the destructive impulses you chose upon character creation, which absolutely causes problems for you both narratively and mechanically. Therefore, players are caught in a vicious cycle. They must spend darkness tokens in order to reliably succeed at their roles and avoid a meltdown. Because you can overshoot your successes, spending tokens is always a risk because it can push you into an instance where your power accidentally overwhelms you or someone your character cares about. Not only is this a great schema to incentivize roleplay, but it reinforces the precarious positions your agents find themselves in. They must always struggle to push themselves, knowing that at any moment, it could all go wrong, even when they're trying their hardest to hold everything together. Characters' struggles between their desire for community and their monstrous death drive culminate in ruin moves. Basically, when you use a move that draws deeply from your monstrous power, or your in-game actions warrant it, you earn a point of ruin, which is a measure of how close you are to fully giving yourself over to the darkness. When you get five points of ruin, you unlock these ruin moves, which are some of the most powerful abilities in the game. Warp space and time to appear at a critical moment out of nowhere, or ask death itself to intervene on behalf of a fallen colleague. But naturally, if you accumulate too many of these ruin advances, you'll eventually lose yourself, falling entirely to the darkness and becoming a harbinger one of the catastrophic beings your division has sworn to destroy. Your character is overcome, and your friends will have to slay you 
or watch the world collapse. This right here is the core tension of Apocalypse Keys, the theme that makes it so tragic and poignant. The end state for your characters is not death, it's so much worse. Eventually you'll become a full-blown monster, just like the creatures you fought countless times alongside your friends. In the end, the people who mean the most to you will be the ones to put you down. Apocalypse Keys is a queer game, written by a queer person. I think that's fundamental to understanding this text. Not just because the game is full of examples of queer love, not just because Najati wrote a whole adventure informed by his relationship with gender and its conflict with Catholicism, but because this game puts you in the position of people who are trying to survive in a world that, while happy to exploit them for their utility and power, does not claim them as its own. That is obviously not the reality of every queer person's experience, but in the US, as we see wave after wave of laws trying to erase trans people from public life, it is hard not to read Apocalypse Key's desperation for acceptance through the lens of queerness. I think there's a commonality in the ways in which queer people and diasporans, hell, basically anyone marginalized from their society, build communities. When you face rejection and violence because of your identity, you have to be really, really careful who you trust to reveal yourself to. When you can't assimilate into the mainstream culture, you have to find others who don't belong as well. And when you find those people, and you get to experience the joy of finally having a space where you are loved because of your identity, not in spite of it, it becomes the most important thing in the world to you. I was already very much on board with my friends or my power methods of storytelling, but I think Apocalypse Keys heightens and amplifies that concept. When you create your character, each playbook asks you to form bonds, connections with NPCs and PCs that represent your relationships with them. You can gain bonds with just about anyone, but the bonds you get at the start of the game set the tone for the messy and integral relationships your characters will have with each other. The Surge, for instance, asks, I love you, but you rejected me for my own sake. Why? The last has a bond that says, You know of another like me. Why does keeping this secret protect me? Narratively, this is a great way to weave your characters' stories together, ensuring everyone has a reason to stay in each other's lives beyond your work with division. Furthermore, mechanically, bonds can be spent to raise or lower the result of a die roll. This ties back to the core loop of spending darkness tokens. While you are always at risk of going overboard because of your darkness tokens, your bonds can bring you back to safety. It's the power of your relationships that stops the darkness from taking control. Najati is not being subtle about this mechanical benefit to having narrative ties. The text is explicit. Because the PCs are connected to the world and people around them, it makes it easier to control their power. When a PC runs out of bonds, it's easier to lose that control. That's why Apocalypse Keys, while a game hungry for acceptance, is still fundamentally hopeful. The odds are always stacked against you, and, at the end of it all, you are not going to make it out alive. But from the very beginning, you're bound to the people around you, people who you love, people who have tremendous power to hurt you, but who you're willing to trust anyway. You are doomed to never be accepted by the world at large, but you can still find community with the people who are different in the same way as you. You will see the world burning, and you will fight to save it anyway, because the people you love are still in it. Maybe the world is already ash. Maybe you'll end up burning it down personally. But maybe you'll hang on. Maybe, through the strength of your bonds, you can make the world anew before you burn out, or at least do enough good that your friends will still be here when you finally succumb to dust. Apocalypse Keys believes that promise is worth the heartbreak. You will not always be unclaimed. Uh, hey, uh, thank you for watching, everyone. I uh, really appreciate everybody who takes the time to uh, 
get to the end of these videos. Um, I hope this was a good one. I tried really hard, and I think uh, Ray did an incredible job uh, at this game. You should all read Apocalypse Keys uh, if, if that wasn't uh, clear from the review. Uh, if you want to find more of my work, I'm at AaronSXL on Twitter. Uh, my main site is aavoit.com, where I talk about games, writing, and health policy. I also, uh, as as I released this, I recently released a, a setting guide that's fitly a Midwest fantasy. You can find that um, at aaronsxl.itch.io if you want to, um, you know, support me or the channel. Uh, I think it's a pretty good piece of writing, and it's about being in Indiana uh, for all the good and bad that that is. Um, I also do two podcasts. The first is at Mortified Pod, where me and my friend Layla do critical media analysis. We're going to talk about Chicken Run, the 2000 uh, claymation film about chickens. So <laughs> buckle up. That will be something. And another do I do another show uh, that's at the Bible Boys, where me and my ex-evangelical friends, Michael and Josh, talk about Christian media. Uh, so if those seem like something you might be interested in, please check them out. Uh, thanks, as always, for watching. I hope to have another video out soon. Um, until then, thank you. Bye.